It seems now an almost unquestioned truth that the feminists of the suffragette movement were responsible for women getting the vote, that their militant tactics were necessary to force the male dominated establishment to give women the vote and that men at the time all resisted this. The details of their militancy is often underplayed and rarely discussed in detail, so we form the opinion that it is little more than civil disobedience and the breaking of a few windows. In this light, their imprisonment and force feeding is seen as harsh treatment for women simply wanting to express their political opinions. And what are the suffragists? Have you ever even heard of them? Why have they been so forgotten by history in favour of the suffragettes? Perhaps they are dismissed because they failed and it was only the militant feminists who succeeded. That surely must be the explanation. The problem with this view of the women's suffrage movement is that almost none of it is true. It seems entirely designed to raise the status of the suffragettes and make it appear like they represented the majority of women when in fact nothing could be further from the truth. So what's the real story? The movement for women's suffrage started long before the suffragettes came into existence. It can really be traced all the way back to the Chartist movement that campaigned between 1838 and 1858. The first draft of the People's Charter included votes for women, but it was decided to drop this as it might reduce the chances of getting universal male suffrage, which was the main aim of the movement. However, many of the movement's leaders supported female suffrage, and the movement itself had a large number of female members, even if they were primarily campaigning for their husband's right to vote. The Chartists were ultimately unsuccessful although the Reform Act of 1867 did double the size of the electorate, giving most male heads of household the vote in urban areas, so for the first time it included some of the urban working class. This did still leave the majority of men without the vote. Also in 1867, the National Society for Women's Suffrage was formed, being the first national group to campaign for the vote for women. They would become known as the Suffragists. A young 19-year-old Millicent Garrett had joined the London Society for Women's Suffrage the year before. This was now merged into the new National Society. Through this organisation, Millicent would meet many campaigners for women's suffrage, including the MP Henry Fawcett. Despite their 14-year age difference, the couple soon married and she became Millicent Garrett Fawcett. Millicent was soon noted for her public speaking and rose quickly through the new organisation. This success was halted slightly by her husband's death in 1884, after which she withdrew from public life for a period of about a year. Whilst the suffragists had many supporters in Parliament, they didn't have the backing of either of the two main parties. There had been attempts to introduce private members bills to grant women the vote, but they had always been doomed to be given insufficient time to pass. The first real opportunity came in the 1884 Representation of the People's Act. This would extend the franchise to rural areas and make other reforms. It was only now that the majority of men had the vote, although it still left approximately 40% of men disenfranchised. The women's suffrage supporters in the House of Commons introduced an amendment proposing that women should be given the vote on the same terms as men. This amendment would fail when the Prime Minister, William Gladstone, made it clear that he did not support the amendment. He argued that passing the amendment might result in the entire bill being voted out. Despite many further attempts, this would be the last major voting reform prior to the First World War. The suffragists had suffered several splits over the years, not least because some of the feminists within the organisation had preferred to focus on the campaign for the repeal of the Contagious Diseases Act. In 1890, the leader of the suffragists died, and Millicent Fawcett 
was appointed the new leader of the organisation. In 1897, the suffrage societies again reunited in the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies and Millicent was appointed the leader of the new organisation. With the Conservatives in power between 1886 and 1905, except for one weak Liberal government, there had been little opportunity to get a new bill into Parliament. By this time, the suffragists had 305 constituent societies and nearly 50,000 members. The suffragists at their peak only managed about 2,000 members. The suffragists were mainly from the middle class, but there were some working class members as well. Also, men were allowed to join the organisation, unlike the newly formed suffragettes. In October of 1903, six women, including Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughter Sylvia, split from the suffragists and formed the Women's Social and Political Union. They were disappointed at the lack of success from the suffragist strategy of lobbying Parliament and instead favoured more direct action. Men were barred from joining this new organisation and it initially campaigned with the Independent Labour Party led by Keir Hardy. The women of this organisation were first described as suffragettes in the Daily Mail in 1907 which would go on to be the name by which they are remembered. It took a while for the suffragettes to build a sufficient level of support to be noticed, and their initial tactics were simply to mount demonstrations to lobby Parliament. These demonstrations did include some civil disobedience that led to the arrests of a handful of protesters. Over the years, their support did increase, but the suffragists remained the larger organisation throughout their existence. At first, many newspapers openly supported the suffragettes' actions. In October 1906, the Daily Mirror said of them, By what means but screaming, knocking and rioting did men themselves ever gain what they are pleased to call their rights? And the Daily News said, No class has ever got the vote except at the risk of something like a revolution. By 1906, Emmeline's other two daughters, Christabel and Adela, had become active members of the suffragettes, and Christabel in particular had risen to a senior position. In this year, the newly formed Labour Party adopted the cause of female suffrage, although it still remained more focused on obtaining the vote for the roughly 40% of men who didn't qualify. The Pankhursts, however, were becoming more right-wing, and moving away from their earlier relationship with the Independent Labour Party, and so they didn't give the Labour Party their backing. Indeed, the suffragettes were increasingly becoming an exclusively middle-class organisation. In fact, they never actually supported universal suffrage. Instead, they campaigned for women getting the vote on the same terms as men. This would still leave a large percentage of working-class men and women without the vote. In 1907, Christabel Pankhurst cancelled the suffragettes annual conference and announced that all future decisions would now be taken by a committee that she would appoint. This set Christabel up as the dictatorial leader of the organisation and so about 70 members left the suffragettes in protest at this authoritarian move. They went on to found the Women's Freedom League. Meanwhile, the suffragettes had been pursuing their campaign to get private members' bills introduced to grant female suffrage. In 1907, W.H. Dickinson introduced the Women's Suffrage Bill that was talked out at second reading. This bill was supported by a march of 3,000 suffragists in terrible weather that caused it to be nicknamed the Mud March. In 1908, Henry Stranger introduced another similar bill which passed second reading by 271 votes to 92 against. But the government refused to give it sufficient time to become law. In July 1909, the suffragette Marion Dunlop was arrested for a third time and immediately went on hunger strike demanding to be treated as a political prisoner. 
even though she had actually been arrested for writing on the walls of the House of Commons. After 91 hours of this hunger strike, she was released on medical grounds. This served to be the trigger for the suffragettes' regular campaign of hunger strikes in prison that proved such a political success. A lot has been made over the years of the suffering of the suffragettes due to the hunger strikes and force feeding. But ask yourself, when has a man ever been released from prison for going on hunger strike? The government even later created a specific act, the popularly called Cat and Mouse Act, to allow the authorities to release suffragettes and later re-arrest them. This is despite the fact that by this time the suffragettes had stepped up their campaigns and the crimes that they were now committing were very far from being minor acts of civil disobedience. The act was also largely a failure as suffragettes hid release prisoners and made re-arrest very difficult. Between 1910 and 1912, three bills were introduced into Parliament to give women the vote. The so-called Conciliation Bills. It should, however, be noted that these bills limited the right to vote to women that qualified through property ownership, which was the position that the suffragettes supported. The first bill ran out of time, although Asquith, the Liberal Prime Minister, promised to reintroduce it in the next session of Parliament. The second won a majority of 255 votes to 88 against as a private member's bill. But Asquith decided instead to support a universal male suffrage bill to be introduced in the next session and promised that female suffrage could be added to this bill as an amendment. Neither actually happened. The third bill was defeated at second reading in 1912 by 208 votes to 222 against. It was only defeated because the Irish nationalists thought it would be used to obstruct Irish home rule. At this point, it is clear that female suffrage was on the edge of being granted, even if only for a limited group of women. There was clearly a majority in the House of Commons that supported women's suffrage, and arguably there had been since 1908. It was now just a question of the government giving a bill sufficient support to make it into law. It seems strange then that the suffragettes would choose this time to change their tactics and become significantly more militant. One statement that has been shown to be true again and again is that one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. And the winning side will have the final say on how a movement is remembered throughout history. But what other description could be used to describe the suffragette tactics between 1912 and 1914? Their terrorist acts included the following. Arson attacks on churches, trains, theatres and museums, sending bombs and hazardous chemicals through the post, breaking shop windows and violent attacks on specific individuals. They generally avoided trying to actually seriously injure anybody, but their attacks carried a significant risk of doing so by accident. Specific attacks included firebombing Lloyd George's house, who was Chancellor at the time and a supporter of female suffrage, bombing Kew Gardens and attempting to bomb Westminster Abbey. In July 1912, Mary Lee threw a hatchet at Prime Minister Asquith, but she missed, hitting and injuring the Irish nationalist leader, John Redmond. This was not the first violent attack on a politician. In November 1909, the then Chancellor Winston Churchill was assaulted with a horsewhip by Theresa Garnett, but she failed to cause any injury. In June 1913, Emily Davidson died at the Epsom Derby when she attempted to attach a suffragette scarf to the king's horse and ended up colliding with it. This was not an act of political suicide, as many have since claimed. Also in 1913, the suffragettes appointed the fiercely militant feminist Nora Dacre Fox as General Secretary. 
Dacre Fox operated as a highly efficient propagandist, delivering rousing speeches at the suffragette weekly meetings and writing many of Christabel Pankhurst's speeches. She would later join the British Union of Fascists, along with two other leading suffragettes, Mary Sophia Allen and Mary Slasher Richardson, who was famed for attacking the Rockaby Venus with a chopper she smuggled into the National Gallery. Many have tried to argue over the years that these tactics were necessary for women to gain the vote, but they were very close to achieving women's suffrage prior to stepping up the attacks. These tactics would also turn public opinion against the suffrage movement and were denounced by many other supporters of the movement at the time. As early as 1909, Lloyd George said, The action of militants is ruinous. The feeling among sympathisers of the cause in the House of Commons is one of panic. I am frankly not very hopeful of success if these tactics are persisted in. He also once confessed that meeting Christabel Pankhurst was like going to the lunatic asylum and talking to a man who thinks he is God. In 1912, the Manchester Guardian said, The madness of the militants, the small body of misguided women, who profess to represent the noble and serious cause of political enfranchisement of women, but in fact do their utmost to degrade and hinder it. But perhaps most significantly, even Millicent Fawcett, the leader of the suffragists, turned against the suffragettes. She had initially hailed the suffragettes' courage and dedication to the cause, but in 1912 she declared that hunger strikes were mere publicity stunts and that the militant activists were the chief obstacle in the way of success of the suffrage movement in the House of Commons. Indeed, the suffragists actually refused to join a suffrage march after demanding, without success, that the suffragettes stop their support of property destruction. It should come as no surprise that these tactics would turn public opinion against the movement. In fact, governments have for centuries implanted agent provocateurs in organisations specifically to discredit those movements. Indeed, the Canadian police were caught doing this as recently as 2007. It's hard to believe that the suffragettes were acting against women's suffrage as agent provocateurs even if you acknowledge their links to establishment forces. What is perhaps more likely is that the goal was to build a broader movement of dedicated women to campaign on a variety of issues. Whilst militant action does have the effect of turning the wider public against you, it will also gain you support from the most committed of your supporters. So maybe the goal was to create a smaller but more militant feminist organisation that would live beyond this single issue. In 1913, with the terrorist acts losing the suffragette support, Christabel Pankhurst decided to widen the campaign. She would now launch an attack on men in general. Playing on the widespread alarm about the abuse of young girls as prostitutes, she wrote a pamphlet entitled The Great Scourge and How to End It. In this pamphlet, she claimed that 75 to 80% of men were infected with venereal disease, primarily syphilis and gonorrhea. She also claimed that men resisted women's suffrage because it might bring an end to their promiscuity and that women should avoid sexual contact with men until they had the vote, something she had no difficulty with. Men were thus presented as sexual poison and campaigning under the banner votes for women and chastity for men, she claimed that extreme militancy was justified as a surgical operation to cleanse society of this menace. It was also at around this time that a split occurred in the Pankhurst family. Sylvia had continued campaigning with socialist groups much to the dismay of Emmeline and Christabel. Adela also favoured greater support for socialist causes and was troubled by the suffragettes' militant tactics. Adela left the organisation not long after Emmeline and Christabel expelled Sylvia. Emmeline then dispatched Adela to Australia. They would never see each other again. Sylvia, meanwhile, 
would set up a rival suffrage and socialist organisation that was first called the Women's Suffrage Federation, but then change its name to the Workers' Socialist Federation. In the end, it became part of the Communist Party of Great Britain. With the outbreak of war in 1914, the suffragettes immediately stopped campaigning for women's suffrage, and the government freed all suffragette prisoners. The suffragists continued their campaign, although it was in a somewhat muted way. It may seem surprising now, but at the time the suffrage movement wasn't universally popular amongst women. Whilst we might think of the anti-suffrage movement being largely male, this is not actually the case. Organised anti-suffragism outside of Parliament really started after the House of Commons passed a suffragist resolution by a large majority in 1904. Women were part of the movement from the very start and they argued that there was a silent majority that supported their views. In July 1908, the Women's National Anti-Suffrage League was founded under the leadership of Mary Ward. In December, the League submitted a petition to Parliament against women's suffrage containing just over 337,000 signatures. This was the largest petition on women's suffrage since 1874. And the following year, the suffragists could only manage to get 289,000 signatures on their petition. Women actually constituted the majority of the anti-suffrage movement, at least the rank and file. They made up more than two-thirds of the subscribers to the anti-suffrage central office and five out of six subscribers at branch level. It is actually possible that a majority of women at the time were against female suffrage. The anti-suffrage leagues were keen on a referendum to determine women's views. In Asquith's cabinet, the idea was discussed around 1911. The referendum issue surfaced throughout the debates, the main anti-suffrage league declaring that such an important reform shouldn't be introduced without a mandate. In 1917, Mary Ward suggested radical local government reform which would supply a large body of women electors from whom a referendum on the subject of parliamentary suffrage could be taken. The suggestion wasn't taken up, lest, presumably, it came up with the wrong answer. What is also clear is that the suffragists and suffragettes were very much against the idea of a referendum, and so in the end it never happened. It is interesting to note how the establishment actually sided with the suffrage movement on this issue. Of course, the question is, why were so many women against the vote? First, it should be noted that a lot of these anti-suffrage groups did support women being involved in local politics and voting in local elections. They only objected at the national level. There were several main reasons why women sided with the anti-suffrage movement which included the fact that the state relied on the use of force in military matters and policing, of which women had no experience and no obligation to participate in. This goes back to the notion that was present as far back as ancient Athens, that it was the potential obligation to fight that entitled you to vote. Others thought that women would be manipulated by men, or that women were so bound up in family life that they didn't have the necessary experience to vote on state matters. Indeed, most women at the time wouldn't have much knowledge of industry or finance, and the state was less involved in social matters than it is now. It was also thought by some that it would damage the empire, as it would be seen as making the government weak in places like India. And there was always the fear that it would damage family life as it would bring political differences into the family. In essence, all of these objections can be summarised up in the belief in gender roles. A lot of women at the time supported distinct roles for men and women, and feared that granting women the vote would be beginning of the end of the gender distinction. 
which turns out to be fairly accurate. The suffrage movement was very much rooted in the middle classes, and it is perhaps not surprising that women in working classes were very much more supportive of gender roles, as they would be all too aware of the terrible working conditions that a lot of men suffered. One polemicist, who described herself simply as a working woman, wrote in 1910 about these dangerous women, the unemployed rich, who by example and preaching are teaching their humbler sisters that housework is despicable. Between us and them, there is a great gulf, fixed by poverty. As they stand in our doorways, with their pretty skirts gathered round them, are they not shrinking from the unsavouriness within? Of course, most of these objections aren't relevant today, but it's not at all clear that the dismantlement of gender roles has been wholly beneficial to women. And so we shouldn't simply dismiss the women of the anti-suffrage movement as not knowing what was in their best interests, or as women who had been manipulated by men. The anti's fight against the vote puts the contemporary angst about getting equal numbers of men and women into frontline politics and boardrooms into perspective. A century ago, women would simply have said that they had other, better things to do. And perhaps they did. The advent of the First World War largely stopped suffrage campaigning. Indeed, the suffragettes stopped altogether. Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst instead focused their attention on the White Feather Movement that tried to shame men into going to fight. They also campaigned for the introduction of conscription. Indeed, it is clear from one of Emmeline's speeches at the time that she saw this as an obligation that men had to women and that the very least they could do was go to the trenches to fight and die to protect the women of England. It would seem that Emmeline and Christabel, like many feminists that would come after them, were all in favour of gender roles when it suited them, but not when they thought they were disadvantaged by them. Equality for women in all things, just as long as they want it. Of course, some suffragettes objected to dropping the campaign for women's votes and questioned the use of funds collected for women's suffrage for this new purpose. Emmeline simply dismissed them as pro-German traitors, and so those women left the organisation to form their own groups. Meanwhile, the other daughters, Sylvia and Adela, both spoke out against the war, seeing it as a war fought by capitalist oligarchs and just another way of exploiting the working class. Emmeline was horrified by this and wrote a letter to Sylvia expressing her shame at the position she and Adela had taken. In 1917, after the February Revolution, Emmeline took part in a delegation of women to Russia, sponsored by the British government. Their aim was to help persuade the Russian people not to support any moves to accept Germany's offer of peace. No doubt she intended to achieve this by persuading Russian women to put pressure on their male compatriots. In August, she met with Alexander Kerensky, the socialist revolutionary who was now prime minister of the provisional government. Kerensky was not impressed and concluded that she had nothing to teach the women of Russia. Of course, Russia did actually stay in the war until the Bolshevik coup in November led to their ultimate withdrawal. When Emmeline returned to England, she found that women's suffrage was about to become a reality. Lloyd George had become Prime Minister in December of 1916, and as a strong supporter of universal suffrage for men and women, he introduced the Representation of the People's Act, which would give the vote to all men over 21 and most women over 30. The Act became law in February of 1918. The suffragettes responded by creating the Women's Party to stand in elections. This new political party which was still only open to women to join, campaigned for equal job opportunities and changes to family law that favoured women. Of course, those were all matters for after the war, 
the party maintained its unflinching support for the war against Germany. Emmeline didn't actually stand in the general election of 1918, but Christabel did. She narrowly missed out on winning her seat, and indeed the Women's Party was even less successful in the other constituencies they stood in. The party wound itself up in June 1919, so bringing an end to the suffragette movement. It seems odd, when looking back at what actually happened, that we now celebrate the suffragettes at all. Why haven't we dismissed them as militant radicals and instead given all of the credit to the suffragists? After all, the suffragist campaign for far longer, being formed some 37 years before the suffragettes appeared. They also had some significant successes in this time and gained a large body of support within the House of Commons. It was true that neither of the two main party leaderships had taken up the cause, and so they were yet to succeed. But with supporters like David Lloyd George rising up through the ranks of the Liberal Party, that was all about to change. Even when the suffragettes did appear, did they really help the cause? They were far smaller than the suffragists. At their peak, the suffragists boasted 100,000 members while the suffragettes could only manage a paltry 2,000 members. The suffragists also showed their belief in gender equality by allowing both male and female members, whilst the suffragettes allowed only women in their ranks. And what of their other failings? The suffragettes were led by the tyrannical Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst, who consistently stamped out any dissension in their organisation leading to several groups breaking away from their authoritarian rule. Their acts of violence were also not trivial acts of civil disobedience. These were serious acts of terrorism, destroying property and risking deaths or serious injury. They also had no interest in representing all women. They quickly became an exclusively middle-class organisation that didn't actually support giving the vote to working-class women. When their militant campaign proved to be a disaster for their cause, they doubled down on the rhetoric and claimed the problem was all men, who were infested with disease and primarily concerned with maintaining their access to prostitutes. So why then is our view of history so distorted in favour of the suffragettes? Sure we can understand why subsequent generations of militant feminists might venerate the suffragettes, but why does the mainstream media not give truth to the lie? Why does everybody, from politicians to journalists to political campaign groups, all support this version of history? Or to put it another way, why does the male-dominated establishment, the so-called patriarchy, allow this lie to persist? Perhaps the answer here lies in the Pankhurst actions once war broke out with Germany. They immediately stopped their suffrage campaign and instead campaigned in support of the war, joining forces with the establishment to shame men into fighting and campaigning in favour of forced enslavement of men to fight in the horrible conditions of the First World War trenches. Here then, the establishment recognises a powerful ally, even sending Emmeline to Russia to help campaign to stop the new socialist government from withdrawing from the war. Perhaps, just perhaps, the feminist movement isn't the anti-establishment movement it claims to be, but in reality, it is the establishment's greatest propaganda tool. But that is a discussion for another day. <laughs>